Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of All Day Edify, the show where we're your hosts, Corey and Natasha Feimster. That's right. And our aim is to inform, uplift, and enlighten you all day, every day. That's right. So on today's show, we're going to focus on one of our superheroes in the urban community. And that person is known as a community outreach consultant. Absolutely. Very important role in the community. And we have a subject matter expert, someone who is passionate about being exactly that a superhero in the community who is able to provide resources and connect people with those resources. Now, as we get ready, and before we even get started and bringing her in, we want to talk a little bit about why this subject, this topic is so important. Now, the reason that it's important is because the poverty rate is high across the United States. When we think about the poverty rate, what we have to think about is the factors that impact the poverty rate, as well as the statistical data that tells us that the poverty rate is being impacted by so many people. Now, when we look at these factors, we're talking about um, things like the fact that there is a difficulty in getting a good job or job growth. Um, we're also talking about, and this is data that has shown us that a lack of a good education plays a big role in you being able to uh, get outside of or escape poverty. Another thing that's really important is uh, food and water, very valuable necess necessities, um, a lack of government support, which in some cases does not apply in the United States compared to other countries, um, but also a lack of health care and the high cost of living. All of these factors impact poverty. And when we're talking about poverty, well, what we're actually talking about the fact that According to the 2020 census data, the official poverty rate in 2020 was up uh, from 10.4% to 11.4% in 2019. We also know that in 2020, there were 37.2 million people in poverty. That's approximately 3.3 million people more than the year before. And between 19 and 20, poverty rates increased for married couples as well. That's why people who combine their income working together, these families struggle, and especially with female family householders. And so the poverty rate does not discriminate, unfortunately, by age. 18 people, people who are 18 years old and younger saw an increase from 2020, uh, from 2019 to 2020 of 1.5% from 14 .1 to 16.1%. And then also age 18 to 64, that adult age range went from 9.4 to 10.4 from 19 to 20. And so we also know that in 2020, last bit of statistical data, we saw that the pandemic was impacting so many people. And what we discovered from this census information is that over 28 million people throughout the year 2020 with, without having any kind of healthcare coverage at all for the entire year. And so these are big numbers. We know poverty is big, but so is hope. And this is why we have our guest with us today. Absolutely. So today our guest will be none other than one of those superheroes who functions in the community that she serves in as a community outreach consultant, Monica Frazier. Hello, hello, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, for having out, thank you for coming on to the show. Why don't you go ahead, we know who you are. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our viewers um, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Monica Frazier, born and raised in Flint, worked in the world of education for over 27 years. I can probably say probably about 35 years now. Uh, passion so strong uh, working in community that I had to take a leap of faith and step out and put boots on the ground and work within the community the way Monica can work with the community to impact them versus doing it on a regular uh, routine nine to five job. If you could please share with us your specific bio. Um, your educational background. I know you shared that you've had some um, some experience in education, but what is your your specific background been in terms of your education and then some of the experiences leading up to where you are now? Okay, so uh, way back when, and I won't say way back when because I consider myself still a young woman. I was in the, uh, I went to school for social work. 
at that point in time during my internship, I decided I didn't want to be a social worker because I felt like the system would not allow me to help community the way they could truly be helped. And I don't want to use, well, I'm going to say to actually build them up so that they're able to sustain their homes. So then I left that uh, when I finished my social work degree, then I went into organizational development, which not knowing then, I realized that in my to receive my bachelor's also in organizational development, that that social work degree helped me to understand and be able to work with people even greater because I was able to picture and envision their experiences and walk in their shoes right alongside with them to give them that support. So then I mastered in um, organizational development mass, uh, management. And then I went on to get my education specialist degree because I felt that gave me even a bigger picture because you got to remember I was in the world of education. So I was able to then take all of my education and it all kind of complemented each other so that I could see the bigger picture. Often we stay in our silo only seeing what we see in our arena of what we do. And by me receiving my education, I can really say, that that variety of education then complemented each other. And I was able to look at the big picture of everything that took place from the world of education mm -hmm. to community, which has always been my love to serve and to help. Absolutely. So I imagine you've had a ton of experience as an educator um, working with families, even of your students. So I could see and I can imagine as you're talking how there is a hand in glove fit with uh, organizational development and connecting with families, uh, having spent so much time working with their younger people. Yeah, and my passion has always been for the adult learner, because I always believe that the adults, as we experience life and life goes through, it really and we're going through life, it really impacts our household. So my passion was always with the adult learners. So when I was in the classroom, it was teaching adult education. When I was in the uh, actual school district, K-12 school district, I was in curriculum and instruction where I was uh, giving support to writing uh, curriculum and doing professional development. So I have a, I'm now I'm with the babies and I'm with the whole families. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm providing resources to help build babies up and prepare them for kindergarten, but at the same time, still giving that adult that same support. And that's on my nine to five because I am still currently working. But from my business standpoint, I'm with the whole family and the community as a whole outside of my nine to five. So I, I got a lot going on. Gotcha. But good, good work, good work. Good, good. All right, so I know we had a couple of other questions for you. If you would go ahead, Tasha. All right. So, yeah, I do have a question for you, Monica. So why does this topic, why is it so important to you? Why is this topic in this lifestyle that, you know, the services that you provide, why does it mean so much to you? Because when I'm out there in the community and I'm watching uh, my community have struggles and have all of these barriers that they're dealing with from being ex-offenders, maybe not having their education, uh, a lot of times mental health is big, substance abuse is big. And what I be, what I understand is that they're giving the best that they have and, during, and doing the best that they have. So rather than me go in and provide them a service that I feel like only band-aids the situation and keeps them coming back, I want to build their capacity and give them the skills and, and, the, and the tools and the knowledge to be able to sustain their, their homes and then receive all of the help that they need that may help to tear down those barriers. I'm about tearing down and digging up the, the roots of, of what's going on and then planting new seeds so that so that they'll be able to sustain their homes and, and, and help their families and, and, and live a comfortable life like America is providing for us, so to speak. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you point out something really important there. You talk about how it is that opposed to band-aiding a situation, and I, I spend time in development myself, and you, we know the difference between band-aiding a situation versus actually looking at ways to strategically, step-by-step, step, 
build and organizationally develop hope, instilling hope in people by giving them baby steps to take so that the big picture becomes overall growth and development. Um, right. How do you how do you kind of look at that in terms of dealing with and connecting with families in terms of, look, I want to instill hope in you as we take these baby steps? Well, I, I like to write programs. So really to start really even providing them with the resources that they need. One of the things I do when I'm out in community is I, I survey. We and my team will ask them we give multiple surveys, we have community dialogues, we have conversation, we're total FaceTime asking them what is it that they need. And so that's how we develop the programs for them because when you ask them what they need, that means you you truly care about what it is they want. Oftentimes as, uh, I just wanna say what the neighborhood and the residents call us is the system. They they are used to us just coming in telling them what they need to do and so when you ask them what they need you're you're giving you're showing interest you're showing that you care so that gives them hope right there that it's somebody that's connected to them that really cares about what they're experiencing and then asking them what they need and the key things that they have always mentioned all the time was what you had on your um on your post uh employment mental health is a big thing uh, job security and they and they want housing and then there is a lot of families who have uh, parents or children who are ex-offenders so even with that that has become a big project of project of mine is because they come out of prison and they give them all these stipulations that they have to get a job and they and they have to do all these list of things in order to to stay out but then everyone wants to close the door on them so then we started working with that piece. So giving them that hope is starting off by showing them that their voice matters. Everything I do is pertaining to their voice and it has nothing about, nothing to do with what I think. It's everything about what they're thinking. So when you do that, then they have hope because then they begin to believe in you and trust Absolutely. you. Absolutely, I agree. That's a good approach to take. And I, as I listen to you and you talk about some of your experiences, being in education, being in curriculum development and then developing programs. And then at the same time, uh, kind of taking in and getting buy in with people so that you know exactly what it's going to take to give them reasons for optimism and hope. Um, let me ask you this. If you are not doing what you do right now, right, let's just say. Um, even with your experiences, if you were not doing what you're doing right now, what do you think that you would be doing? You know, I, right now what I'm doing, I know for a fact it's my gifting, it's my ministry. And I can honestly say that if I, if I hadn't been, if I'm not doing, if I was not doing this, I might've been miserably sitting and still sitting in that position that I was sitting in when I was working uh, for the K-12 school district just trying to get my time like a lot of people so that I could go ahead and retire, never never fulfilling my true dream. But I thank God that he kicked me out the nest because gotcha. he made it so uncomfortable for me that I stepped out on faith and I took this approach. And, in, and as a result of me taking this approach, I went a whole year and a half without a job, um, I hadn't worked for so long that when Macy's hired me, I was happy. I was like, yeah, I could, I could buy Christmas presents for everybody. And then a lady approached me. So see, even when I took the leap of faith, I still continued to send resumes in the old type of work that I was doing, getting interviews, but not getting a hire. And so that that's an example of when you keep trying to stay in your box that you're comfortable with. A lady approached me. I was teaching adult education class, one of my students, and she said, you know, you're a very passionate woman. I have a job I want you to apply for. And I applied for it, and she gave it to me right on the spot. And, and that's what really put me in that world of community, the way I like it for me to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do. And it was a true blessing. 
Gotcha. gotcha. And I'll never leave that lane. Now I know when I, I always know when I'm going outside my lane, it never works. I'll never leave that lane. I understand where I'm gifted and where my ministry is. And this is where I'm going to stay. Very good. But I imagine uh, that, that, that testimony is probably real powerful and impactful when you share it with people who may be on the fence about uh, going through some kind of career change or uh, stepping out to do some things beyond uh, their personal box or what their experiences have been as well. Right. And you kind of froze up <laughs> when you said that. So I missed the piece. You froze up on me. Gotcha. No, I was just saying, I imagine sharing your testimony with people that you're providing services for is probably inspiration for them to, to see that they too can make those kinds of changes in their lives and have good results. Right. And, it, and it's not easy. It is a, a faith walk. is not easy. And that's when you begin to, when I say plant that seed, you know, uh, of course, at some point when I'm in community and I'm talking about a faith walk, I'm also implementing what I believe as a Christian, you know, I can't leave that out. I had to leave it out working in a in a, a regular secular work world, but I have the opportunity where I don't have to leave it out when I'm using it for my business. And I and I don't when I'm talking about my walk and my leap of faith and and how I stepped out and went a whole year with no job and no money and everything just started happening. Uh, uh, my husband was on his faith walk, and so we were sitting here looking at each other like, what are we going to do? And we were getting money. We we didn't miss a beat as far as, and probably gained 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah. So y'all was eating good. Yeah. We were eating good. We said, well, we know we eating good, and our bills are paid. We didn't worry about a thing, and then the Lord just started putting everything in place. Good, good. So with, with regards to the services that you provide, Monica, how has the services changed pre-COVID versus how it is now? So what are your compare and contrast to how the services are compared to how COVID is? Okay, so prior to the services were wide open, everybody seated together and we were able to have the workshops in the normal life that we knew it then. And then when COVID hit, we really had to uh, put pause on everything so that we could figure it out. And then we decided that we would do sort of the hybrid in person, but we cut the the uh, the participants in half to have instead of two sessions, we we will now have four sessions. We'll pick it back up after the new year, but we're going to have four sessions uh, in groups of twelve. That's how the cohort will be, and um, they have to go through the whole complete. Uh, eight week process and uh, that's what we're going to do we're, we're going to do some hybrid and then we'll do some in person but a lot of the things have to be hands on so a lot of it will be in person in a, in a little bit virtual I should say yeah gotcha, gotcha. and so that was a very good question and, and my thinking as, as you were responding to that question and you talk about how hands on you are I imagine you had to have felt like you were trapped going through uh, the COVID process when you'd like to be um, engaged with people and things like that. And so could you explain for us kind of what the pre-COVID day-to-day, week-to-week routine was for you and how that impacts, um, you know, like a big part of like who you are outside of work? Okay, so pre-COVID, I, w I was actually able to walk alongside, if I'm hearing what you say, how I moved my program pre-COVID. Is, mm -hmm. is this what you're... We were able to uh, sit in groups and we... It, it's a very transparent... The cohort group, it, group, group is very transparent where they begin to form relationships with one another. We're able to do more talking it out. In person, it's easier because it's a connection. You have that relational connection where whatever it is that we're saying, they're able to connect to it. And so that that is what made it difficult during COVID time. But let me tell you, what really blessed us is that our last cohort had just completed right when the pandemic hit. So really we were on a, on a break during that whole COVID time. When March, when everything shut down, we had just finished. The only thing we had left to do was court sessions to provide expungements for those that qualify. 
So everything else was a classroom setting. They met twice a month. Uh, we took subject by subject. We always started with, um, uh, the, we call it the root where we do, where we break up the ground and, and, and so that people can reevaluate and figure out, you know, where they really are and how they got there and accept how they got there. And then we move forward piece by piece with life. So you start read self-evaluation, you wind up with, if you need some support or some counseling, then, you know, we go into the, the job placement. Then we go, and during the whole process, we're gauging and we're surveying and we're talking to them if they qualify for the expungement. So during the process, they know through all of the workshops that they qualify for expungement, they're doing that process. So it's like a step-by-step -step, uh, figuring it out, I'm gonna use to simplify it, like you and I would do. If something is going on in our life where we know we have to backtrack and get it right to move forward, that's kind of how we take them is a step-by-step. -step. So they're not in this fight or flight mode or in this freeze mode, uh, not try, not being able to figure out how to get out of where they are, but helping them to get out where they are. So, so being in class and, and in person is very important to me. But now we figured out that the the ones that aren't is detrimental that need that in person time is when we'll go virtual and then we'll do in class for everything else. So still the bulk of everything is going to be in class after the new year. It's, we just split it in half, if I answered it right, if that makes sense, when you ask pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, we, we, we round table talking and we're having a good time and, and we're just talking about life. And I'm giving them my experiences. Everybody's transparent. Uh, if, if there's always a social worker on spot, if there's an immediate need for some counseling, um, and we just move right on through. Good. Good, good. And, and we and we and we were able to expunge pre-COVID, eight people mm. got expunged. Wow, wow, that's yeah. awesome. So and you they're working. Are. Oh, and they're working. They're working. See, we have deal. some that are working. We have we have them working. So we have some of them that are homeowners. We have some that opted to go to school, uh, because we started looking at the whole picture. The way I look at it is, how do you and I do it? You know. We know how to critical think. We know how to problem solve. When you're fighting for your life every day, all of those pieces go out the window. You know the tools are there, but you don't know how to use them. Yeah, so yeah, what yeah, we're yeah. doing is bring, we're bringing them back to, to how to use those tools. We don't oh, want yeah. them just standing in line, getting water and food, like you said, in that hopeless state, thinking that this is all that life is when life can be so much better. Wow. Yes. So, so you truly are a superhero for people who that. So when do you get time to take that cape off? Do you have to ever mix personal with business or anything like that? Well, let me tell you, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my life together myself. <laughs> it, it's, it's really hard. It really is hard because I find myself working when I'm not working and then I have to turn off the work. And and so it's I can it's hard. That's one of my barriers that I have. But I'm more and more am learning to relax. And my husband is making me relax. He tells me I do too much, but then he does a lot too. You know, he's very involved. And so um, we're we're going back to taking more vacations now Good. since the yeah. pandemic has lifted. And so we're more. Uh, focused on having time for each other because we started realizing that we were both work, 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 work. And then when we're together, we don't have any energy. And even when we say it's movie night, he's sleeping, I'm asleep in the chair, you know? So, yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> so it is, it's very hard when you're doing this type of work because my heart, you know, goes out to the people. My family say I cry all the time. But if you crying, I'm gonna cry with you and I'm gonna ask you why you crying and then we're gonna figure it out together. So I have to push back, you know, sometimes. And it's hard, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. Good, I gotta good, have some good. me time. I got to. Right. Well, right. Honey, and, so we really wanna um thank you for coming on to the show. You know, you've really given us a great wealth of information. And I think that it's some really good takeaways that our viewers can really 
get from everything that we talked about today. Babe, did you have anything to add? Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I wanted to give an opportunity that because you talked about, um, I know that you're an author and I know that you separate um, what you do uh, professionally um, as well as what you do uh, with your own foundation, right? And so right. if you would kind of introduce us to that just a little bit um, so that people get an idea of where they can reach out and connect with you at, those kinds of things as well. Okay, so first of all, I would like for you all to check out my website, Monica B. Frazier, that's Frazier with a Z, F-R-A-Z-I-E-R.com. Check it out, it talks about my podcast that's coming up, it talks about my book. My book is Purely Foundational. Uh, I, I have a story to tell you on that. I'm not going to be long-winded. You can read the book. So you feel free to purchase the book on my website, monicabfraser.com. Podcast, first podcast will be coming out on November 13th. So stay tuned. It'll be streaming on all platforms. And then just hit me up at goshenplenty at gmail.com if you have any questions. Gotcha. <laughs> My 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 uh, Monica uh, Monica Frazier LLC. The umbrella of that is Set Apart Enterprise. Good, very good, very good. Well, again, we appreciate having you with us on today. Again, we've gained a, a wealth of understanding of exactly what it is that a community outreach consultant does. Many of us may have not known that before we had a chance to kind of take in some of your experiences and your sharing on today. So we thank you for that. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for coming on to the show. And we definitely will want to have you back. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was good. That was, that, good. that was really good. That was a, a great wealth of information. And um, I'm sure that our viewers can actually gain, you know, a great deal of knowledge from just listening to everything that Monica had to say. Absolutely. And so just know that in future uh, episodes like today, uh, we're going to introduce you to individuals who we refer to as superheroes in the community, because these are not necessarily always limelight jobs. Sometimes they're thankless jobs where you serve people and you go tirelessly, your passion is there. And sometimes you have a hard time shutting down and getting to enjoy your own personal life but because you love what you do so much and because people are benefiting so much, you just continue to go and give the best that you have to other people's benefit. And we want to remind you that the aim of our show is to uplift, inform, and enlighten you. All day, every day. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. See you next time. Do you provide human services? Are you an entrepreneur that contributes to society? Do you have access to tools and resources that facilitate growth and development? Come be a guest on our show. You can email us at alldayedify at gmail.com or send us a message on our Facebook page at All Day Edify. From the great city of Flint, Michigan, Sundial Networks presents live at the Golden Link with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow and amateur night with history in the making open mic. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Search us on Roku under Sundial Network. Also available on most smart TVs. On the web at www.sundial.tv. That's sundial.tv. No subscription needed. Watch the TV show with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow. Only on the Sundial Network. Search us on Roku under Sundial Networks every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. That's Sundial.tv. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. www.sundial.tv. A new way to watch TV on the web and on Roku, the High Dimension Network. Check us out on the web at www.highd.tv. That's highd.tv on the web. And search us under High Dimension Networks on Roku.
Yes, we're on the web and Roku. And we're bringing music, news, fashion, culture, and lifestyle. The line of That's My Jam. Top 10 from the streets. And we know sports. New to the game. Legends in music. And so much more. It's about time. Something new in TV. Brand new flavor. On the web and on Roku. High Dimension Network. Check us out on the web at www.high.tv. That's high.tv. On the web. And search us under High Dimension Networks on Roku. Yes, we're on the web and Roku. High Dimension Networks. That's H-I-G-H-D dot TV.